just to let you know how special a place this is. Demi Moore is preaching this morning with her raspy voice. Thanks, for, you're the only one that got that. I thought that was really funny. My wife and I are doing a clinical trial of sorts. We got COVID three weeks ago, and I wasn't over that. She got it less than I did because she's more pure than I am. And then we found out my daughter was sick with a virus and the two grandkids, so we decided in our clinical trial to invite them up to try to help them. And they stayed all week, and they left dancing in the streets, and we got their virus. So what you don't want to do is if you have COVID and you're trying to recover, invite somebody in with two green snakes coming out of their nostrils, <laughs> pink eye, and ear infections. So, but I'm on antibiotics, so once again, I announce to you, I don't think that you can catch this from me. But to be merciful and gracious to you, I will not be serving communion this morning. Suffering. <clears throat> Is there anything more shared in the human experience? Trauma, difficulty, pain of all kinds, emotional, mental, physical, confusion, a lack of direction, self-doubt, Frustrations in relationships, parenting woes, marriage woes, dashed hopes and dreams, indecision, unmet expectations. The list is endless. And if you're of any age at all, you've realized life can be absolutely ruthless and unfair and unrelenting. I don't see the Sheedies this morning, so this will be great. It'll be easier to talk about them. The Sheedies, uh, Janie and Mike, are unbelievably godly people and unbelievably loving people. And it, if for those of you that haven't been at Creekside very long, um, their story is pretty rough. They had five kids, one daughter and four boys. The four boys were all birthed and lived up to three weeks and then passed away. Yeah, that's good life, right? And I remember several years back, Mike's brother died. And I won't go into the details of that, but he died. And I remember he was in the parking lot, and I just felt like I got I to gotta say something to him. I just want to connect with him. So I walked up to Mike, and I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. Of all the people that don't deserve this, you're the one I would pick. And he looked at me and said something to me that was so profound, it just emblazoned upon my soul. He said, we will all suffer. It's just a matter of time. I promise I'm not trying to depress you. But since I feel bad, I think you should all feel bad too. <laughs> really what I'm trying to, did it work, Kimberly? Good. Let's just go home now and lay on the couch and watch the Warriors lose. I'm kidding. Oh, that's what got to you? Suffering is the common human experience. And I say this all the time, the world, life itself, actually works against us, right? And it hurts. And nothing seems to bring out more bad information than when suffering hits us. Remember a couple weeks ago, we were looking at, Brian I was preaching on the passage, I think, and it was the guy born blind. Do you remember how the whole story started? Remember? They asked him, who sinned, the blind guy or his parents? That's called bad information. Ask someone that has suffered, and they will tell you something completely insanely insensitive that someone said to them. When Lynn and I got married, I was 22, she was 23, and six months into it, we, uh, we thought, we've got marriage down, we're ready to go. So we started a youth group, and we started with two kids, and about three months we had like 30 kids, and that's when we really met Brian and Rhonda Fury, and every week they ministered to this, these kids with us. And we, were, we did this for seven years, and we were probably five, four, five, six years into this. And we were all working full-time, by the way, but volunteering this ministry, and it was 20, 20 plus hours a week. And one of our kids passed away. He got in a car accident, no seatbelt, flew through the window and died. And we had the memorial service at the church. And the mom, I was, you know, I was distraught. I mean, I was 26. One of my kids that I'd ministered to all these years was, was, was dead. 
17-year-old guy. And I walked into the, the service and his mom saw me and she walked over to me and she said, do you feel guilty you didn't spend more time with him? That was helpful. The chapter we are entering is one of those chapters. It's painful to read. It's frustrating to process and often leaves us with what we don't want to hear. And even though it ends great, really great, by the way, by the time we get there, our insides are splattered all over the pavement. It's a little bit to me like the book of Job, if you've ever read the book of Job. It ends awesome in the last chapter, but it takes 41 chapters to get there slogging through pain and confusion and turmoil and lousy advice. And yet the story this morning holds the shared experience with each of us and a deeper understanding of just how we should think and perceive the idea of suffering and God's part with it. The story of Lazarus dying, that's the story. And we're gonna take the next month to look at it. And I would also add it's the story of his sisters, Mary and Martha, dying inside. Much like the story of the guy born blind, and we'll be taking quite a bit to process this. And I have the lovely task of sorting through the introductory mess, which I kind of like, by the way. And before we enter this kind of firestorm, let me just remind you, this is the seventh sign. Remember, John has seven signs. I say the seventh sign, but I hesitate to call it the final sign because there's one more beyond the seven. And I hesitate to call it the greatest sign, even though it's clearly the greatest of the seven signs that we've seen, because it points to an even greater sign. The raising of Lazarus is the sign that points us in the direction that the Trinity is ultimately after, raising humanity from the dead. And ra the raising of Lazarus is the sign that points ultimately to Jesus' resurrection, the beginning of He's referred to in the New Testament as the first of the resurrection that makes it possible for all of us to be raised. So with that, let's try to tackle this messy introduction. And what I want to do is three things. First of all, I want to kind of bring us back into this shared experience that we all have. And we'll, and we'll, we'll resonate, we'll relate with frustration um, as we read some of the things that come out of this first 16, 17 verses. And then I want to turn that around and look at the assumptions that I think we have to make in suffering if we want any chance at finding peace. And then very quickly at the end, what is our responsibility within it? So first of all, the shared experience. So, so what happens? Let's set the stage and then let's let our hearts and minds kind of enter into it. So we're going to look at the who, we're going to look at the where, we're going to look at the when, and then we're going to look at the kind of the dratted what. So first of all, the who, John 11. This is where our story starts. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll try not to do that very much. <clears throat> now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, and the, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with, with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother, La brother Lazarus was ill. Now, Jesus loved Mary and her sister and Lazarus. These names probably sound very familiar to you if you've been around Christianity at all. There's this whole scene uh, that's actually in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, when Jesus goes to their house, and, and he obviously, you can tell in that passage, knows them very, very well. He's very close. Remember, it's the story where Mary's sitting at his feet, remember? And what's Martha doing? Running around like a chicken with her head cut off, is what my father would say, Right? And she's complaining to Jesus, why won't she help me? Look at all the work I've got to do. It's the, those are the same people. And in our passage this morning, it says that Mary was the one that anointed Jesus' feet with the costly perfume in the house that actually created a kind of a financial backlash. We're going to look at this in a couple months. It's in John chapter 12. And it records the story. And when Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, sees her do this, he refers to it as an absolute waste of money. Jesus, on the other hand, is so moved by Mary's act. He assumes she's anointing him for his death. It was a week from this morning's passage as Jesus returned to their house for his last Shabbat meal. The bottom line, these three were very close to Jesus. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and you're gonna find this in the coming weeks 
as we unfold this story, they're as close to Jesus as anyone. And I mean anyone, including John and including Peter. John's gospel records, this is the when. When did this take place? John's gospel records at least five trips by Jesus to, to Jerusalem. And as I said before, they, they, they always seem to coincide with a festival, which is why you would go to Jerusalem. In chapter, excuse me, uh, uh, in chapter two, we have the Passover. And we have in chapter seven, the Feast of Sukkot or the Feast of Booths, as it's called. Kimberly shared on the, on the Hanukkah in chapter 10. And then back in chapter five, Shavuot or Pentecost. And our story this morning is the fifth and final really the final trip before the final, final trip. And it's late winter, more than likely about six weeks before Jesus enters Jerusalem for his last week. So seven weeks before Jesus dies, this is where it takes place in our passage. Where does this happen? Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they lived in a small village called Bethany. And what gets confusing in the New Testament is there's actually two Bethanies. There's a Bethany that is not this Bethany. It's Bethany beyond the Jordan, meaning it's on the other side of the Jordan River. And then there's our Bethany this morning. It lies kind of on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. There was, it, was, it was Jesus kind of home away from home. Every time Jesus went to Jerusalem, he would do what he would do in the temple. All these, these sermons or preachings or speakings or healings. And then he would, he would walk the two-mile walk up the hill of the Mount of Olives on, on the east. And he would nestle in to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home to stay there. He stayed there basically <clears throat> every single night of his final week before he died. But Jesus and his disciples are actually not in Bethany right now. They're up north when our story begins. They're east, actually, and up north, which is why we read statements in our passage like verse 3. So the sisters sent to Jesus. Verse 7, then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea again. In fact, they're not even in the region of Judea because the disciples warned him not to go to Judea. More than likely, they are pretty far up north and east. There's a possibility they're as far north as Galilee, although I would guess they're not quite that far. To the previous chapter, right, he was on the other side of the Jordan, but we know he isn't in Judea on the other side. He's quite a distance north on the other side. So why is this important? Well, this brings us to the what, the dreaded what. Lazarus falls ill. And by the way, this is no head cold. He's so sick, the only solution Mary and Martha have is what? Jesus. Now again, and we'll, we'll bring this out over the next several weeks, this isn't today's medicine, right? You get a fever back then, it was a big, big, big deal. But he's de- degenerating quickly. He's dying. And it's so serious, they send word to Jesus, meaning they send someone to travel all the way up north, which took at least two days, possibly even three, but we'll we'll nestle in with two. And then listen to what we read in verse six. So, here, this is terrific. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was ill, after the two days of travel, by the way, He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Yuck. I absolutely wish that wasn't there. Translation. Jesus held back solving the problem. It doesn't look like he even told the disciples what was happening, by the way. He kept it to himself. So in what looks to be Mary and Martha's worst experience of their entire life, when only Jesus can fix the problem, and make no mistake, by the way, he can fix this problem because he actually does fix the problem eventually. Jesus just hangs out for two more days. And then it probably took two to three more days to come back. Two days up, two days sitting around, two more days to travel, and that's the minimum, six to seven days. Jesus, I feel strongly you led me into this job. And now the whole thing 
has gone south. Where are you? Jesus, you blessed us by allowing us to get pregnant, and now we lost the baby. Lend in my experience. Where are you? Jesus, I can't think of a worse timing for this issue to raise its head on me and my family. Where are you? Jesus, all we're trying to do is be faithful and loving, and we're getting our lunch eaten. Where are you? Well, (laughs) I'll tell you where he was in this morning's passage. He's not coming for several days. And lest you think I'm overplaying this, verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly, oh yeah, Lazarus has died. Plain and simple, this is one of those times God does not come across very well. And to make matters worse, if that's possible, he waited on purpose. And to make it even more frustrating, let me read verse four. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. When we are hurting and we are confused and we are struggling, hearing God will be glorified usually doesn't connect in a super helpful way to me. I want to suggest this is the human experience. And almost to make matters worse, Jesus gives us either the or at least a reason. The only one he gives, by the way, and I'm not sure... That is what any of us really want to hear when we are in this kind of pain. Verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. What's he saying? It was on purpose. I'm glad I did it, and this will help your faith. All better? Helpful? Well, let's move to unpeace then what's really happening. This is our shared experience. And Jesus' words on the surface seem to back it up. But let's lift the hood up on this car and see what's true of God in pain. Let's unpeel the assumptions that I think we have to make when we're in pain, when we're struggling, when life gets difficult, when we're suffering, if we want any chance at having peace. Beyond the human experience, and what we read that fuels how we often feel. What is actually going on with God in crisis? What assumptions can we make about life? What assumptions can we make about God from this story that will help guide our hearts and minds through it? Because suffering is bad enough, but suffering with terrible thinking and a bad perspective will destroy you. Jordan Peterson had this amazing talk on bitterness and resentment. In fact, we just, several of us just went to see him in the city and talked about this very thing. This is what he said. Life is suffering. There's a good start. Life is suffering and suffering can make you resentful, murderous, and then genocidal if you take it far enough. So you need an antidote to suffering. And maybe you think you can build walls of luxury around yourself and that will protect you from the suffering. Good luck with that. That isn't going to work. Maybe you think that you could build delusion and live inside that. Well, that's going to fall apart. What is there then that's going to help you fight against suffering? That's easy. It's called the truth. The truth is the antidote to suffering. The reason for that is because the truth puts reality behind you so that you can face the reality that's coming straight at you without becoming weak and degenerating and becoming resentful and wishing for the destruction of being because that's the final hell. The final hell is your soul wishing for the destruction of everything because it's too painful and you're too bitter. And that happens to people all the time. So... What assumptions can we make when we're going through difficulty? There's five I'll give you this morning. I'm sure there's more, but I have COVID fog. Number one, God is not responsible for suffering. He is responsible for his response, though. See, God doesn't do chaos. God doesn't create chaos. God creates order out of chaos. You know, in Genesis, when the whole story started, all the way back in the beginning of chapter one. The world is void 
and empty and dark. And what happens? The Spirit of God, it says, hovers over the dark void, and he does what? He creates order. He creates light. You always have to remember when you're in a tough time to ask yourself, would this have happened in the first two chapters of Genesis when the world was perfect? Every time you're in a difficult situation, you should ask yourself, I literally do this every single time, would this have happened in the first two chapters of Genesis? If not, it's the result of the fall. It's the result of darkness and chaos. Now, you may wrestle with why God created the way he did, allowing free choice, but honestly, I think that's about the easiest question I've ever heard. No freedom, no choice, no choice, no love, no love, no relationship. God never forces himself upon people. So, and here's the big assumption behind the assumption. Assuming that your problem that you're facing is not because you did something stupid. Set that aside. Set set it aside if you do something completely idiotic and then bad stuff happens to you. That's your fault. Setting that aside, if that is not the case, then whatever you're going through is the result of chaos and darkness not God. Jesus didn't cause Lazarus to die. Lazarus would have never died in Genesis 1 and 2. Now, how God responds, that's on him. So assumption one is place your energy in the right place. Stop blaming God for lousy stuff and turn your attention to God, where are you? Fair? Number two, God's response, though often confusing to us, is always for good. And I know this is a hard one to buy in the moment, but we have to believe this. When Jesus finally shows up, Martha goes to him, and she tells him in no uncertain, frustrated terms, this would not have happened if you were here. Mary, and I can't tell which one, we'll we'll unpack this over the next few weeks, Mary is either so sad or she's so angry, she won't even go meet Jesus. And they were incredibly close. So you see, to Mary and Martha, the answer is obvious. Stay here or get here quicker and the whole problem goes away, right? Pretty, Pretty straightforward. Ah, But what's going on with the disciples who are with Jesus to the east and up north? Let me read verse six. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, Jesus stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Now listen to this. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you And are you going there again? And if you haven't been here throughout this study for the last six months, know this. This is no joke when they say this. Jesus has been on the verge of being killed multiple times, running for his life. In fact, he dies shortly after he gets there in our story this morning, just to prove how right the disciples are. Listen to what is said at the end of this passage, verse 14. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go with him that we may die with him. Now, why do I point this out? Why is what's going on with the disciples so relevant? The sisters on the one hand, are convinced that their limited perspective is right, that Jesus should have acted in a certain way. And they're partially right, I think, right? If Jesus was there, he wouldn't have died. And yet, the disciples are convinced from their limited perspective that Jesus should have acted and should act in a certain way. And they're partially right. Don't go at all, because if you go, you're going to die, which is exactly what happened. But, here it is, they're both completely 
wrong. You see, first, if Jesus doesn't wait, he cannot raise him from the dead. Partially foreshadowing what he would do himself and partially foreshadowing what he would do for all of humanity. And if he doesn't go at all, he cannot die for humanity. So here's the answer. You and I have no clue what's going on in our life. Fair? We think we know, and here's the deal. We think we know because we're partially right. You know what partially right is? Pretty much almost all wrong. When I got fired unjustifiably 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, God used it to create the company that Brian and I got to do. Not only did he create the company that we got to have, Brian and I got to spend five days a week together all day for 20 plus years. And ultimately he created the finances and the time for me to pastor this church the last 10 years with no paycheck. Painful, it was terrible to get fired like that. Confusing at times? Absolutely. Glorious? Amen. Romans 8, 28, that famous verse. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And this gets so misinterpreted. It does not say that all things that happen are good, of God's design, or have a good reason or purpose to them. But it does say that God will redeem good out of all situations. We must buy this. He's responsible for his response. And oh, by the way, his response will be good in the end. Number three, God may look absent, but he's always involved. You know, in our passage this morning, all we see is that verse that I read. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. You see, he looks so distant and uninvolved and uncaring. But we will see in the coming weeks what Jesus was really doing. Let's just take a little peek and then we'll bounce back out of it in verse 41 at the very end of the story. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would hear me and always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Tell me, dear Creekside, what was Jesus doing while he delayed those two days and then traveled for several more days down there? What was he doing? What was he doing? Say it louder. He was talking to the Father. He was praying to the Father for Lazarus and for Mary, and for Martha. And oh, by the way, don't forget, he's praying for all his dudes that are marching to Jerusalem where he will be destroyed along with every hope they've ever had. That's incredible to me. Romans eight thirty four: Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us constantly. You are always on Jesus' mind. Hebrews 7.25, consequently, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Since he always lives, he lives to make intercession for them. He lives, listen to that. He lives, he breathes to make intercession for you to his father. I just think that is incredible. You are always on Jesus' heart. You are a constant topic of conversation between Jesus and the father and the spirit. Do you know what the next verse in Romans is, by the way? The one I just read? Who can then separate you from the love of Jesus? No one. Number four, death is merely sleeping to God. And by death, I of course mean physical death, but I actually mean any issue in your life leading up to and including death. 
If Jesus can solve death, he can solve whatever ails you. If Jesus can raise order out of chaos like death, he can raise order out of your issue. Listen to what the master says in verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus, he's fallen asleep. But I go to awaken him. Unless you think Jesus is completely delusional, 10 seconds later, he says this. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Hear the urgency, but let's go. What gives, right? Death is just sleeping to Jesus. Your problem is like sleep to him. I know it's massive to you, and because it's massive to you, it's massive to him in importance. But in difficulty, it's like waking somebody up. And finally, and this is a weird one, <clears throat> his glory is always a shared glory. Remember what I read earlier in the passage. You know those verses in the midst of struggles when it says, ah, but take heart, God's gonna be glorified, right? But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And you're thinking, how in the world does that help me, that God is glorified? Well, God's a trinity. He is always others-focused. So his glory, when he is glorified, it's actually a shared glory with us. So what do I mean by that? Well, what does it mean to glorify God? To glorify God means to simply see him accurately, not to blame him for what we think he is, but to actually see God accurately. You see, when we see God accurately, then we have a chance at seeing ourself and all of life accurately. Don't see God accurately, you'll never see yourself in life accurately. When we see God accurately, we see that we are then created in the image of God. When we see God accurately, we see that he is the creator and thus we are birthed out of them. We are like him. We are, to borrow last week's phrase, derivative. We are his. When we see God accurately, we see he is a trinity and thus we are made out of his essence. We are relational and loving only because he birthed us. When we see God accurately, we see that he's the ruler and thus we can see that we are his under rulers. Remember that from last week? When God is glorified, we share and is glorified. We are glorified too. When he wins, we win. When he is raised, we are raised. We share his glory. 1 Peter 5.10 And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore you, confirm, strengthen you, and establish you. He will glorify you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. And amen. So, what's our responsibility then? When things get tough, and they will, if that's the greatest insight you've gotten out of this morning, you're delusional. They will. What's our responsibility? Jesus, in the middle of this passage, makes this weird statement that doesn't seem to fit anything. Doesn't even seem to fit the story. Verse eight, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. What is Jesus saying? What, why is this here? What does this mean? What does this have to do with the story? What is he saying? He's saying believe. Believe in the truth. Buy into every day in the midst of your struggles that these assumptions that we've looked at this morning are true. That is incredibly hard work, by the way, when you're not doing well. But don't make your struggle harder by simply thinking untrue things. You will have your struggle, and then you will have untruth on top of it. 
And you will only increase your suffering by becoming bitter and resentful and frustrated, and then you'll start hurting everybody around you. God is for you. God is the God of resurrection. God raises dead things, amen? He doesn't create chaos. He rather creates order and beauty out of it. Trust that, trust him. He deserves the benefit of the doubt. He deserves us to buy into all five of these things. God is not responsible for suffering. Look for his response though. And know this church, that even though it's confusing at times, it will always be good. Three, he is never absent. He didn't leave you. When the psalmist would pray, God, where have you gone? It doesn't mean God went somewhere. It means that's their perspective. And it's okay to say that to God. Just know it's not true. God has been there the whole time, suffering with you and pain over you. You don't think Jesus does not want to take you home right this second? It burdens him. It weighs on him that we have to go through this world. This is how much he loves this world. This is how highly he thinks of us as his priests, to be his witness to those around us, when all he wants is for you and I, in a blink of an eye, to be raised to, to him in presence with him. What grandeur he has given us. And remember that death is sleep to him. Your problem is important to him, but it's nothing as far as he's concerned. And finally, his glory is your glory. When he wins, you win. Let's pray. Jesus, first, thanks for keeping my coughing down. I appreciate that deeply. And I think they do too. I love this church. And if I love them this much, I can't fathom how you feel about them. The dignity, the integrity, the faithfulness of these people that struggle to know you, to fight through unmet expectations and pain and hurt, to be light to a world that is dying, literally. Would you strengthen their thinking? Would you, would you uphold them through the power of your right hand? Would you embolden them with these truths? Would you allow each of us to lay our dying Lazarus before you, knowing that you're good and present, the three of you constantly having us on your mind and in your conversation? and that the dying thing is simply falling asleep. And you will awaken that which dies. And for this, we trust you. We give you the benefit of the doubt. And we sing to you because only you deserve it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.